I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours, I truly hope you're safe and sound. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of discussions uh, on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. This morning, I'm I'm really happy to uh, to host Tom Friedman, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, journalist, uh, and foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. Tom, um, first of all, let me welcome you back to Carnegie Connects. Aaron, great to be with you. It's been a while, uh, I think a year or so since you were on the program last. We have a lot to talk about. I'd be remiss though if I didn't uh, mention our our former traveling days with uh, mm -hmm. James Baker. Carla Robbins wanted me to say give you a big shout out and ask you it just to let you know when we're leaving from Andrews. I mean, I, ra I raised Baker only because it's maybe it's a good place to begin because again, it's an editorial comment. So forgive me. Uh, and I apologize. Um, probably was the last time the United States was admired, feared and respected to the degree that it needed to be in the world. And I think it's an appropriate place to start maybe with a question or two about American leadership. We, we now, uh, let me start this way. Um, one of uh, uh, my former bosses, the late Madeleine Albright, uh, referred to the United States, she actually borrowed the phrase from Bill Clinton, as an indispensable power. I used to kid her to say that de Gaulle quipped that the cemeteries of France were filled with indispensable people. But I'm just wondering what your take is. How, how, how should we look at American leadership in a world where power is great and small, seem to be able to challenge American influence uh, and, and power. How, how would you characterize the American role? Well, Aaron, let's, I, I'd, I'd sort of put it in a broader context, um, how power has changed in the world since uh, you and I were traveling on, on Baker's airplane back uh, uh, in that window, amazing window of 1989, 1993. Um, so uh, at one level, um, we have a, a whole new phenomena of what I call the super empowered angry person or small group. Um, and my model for that, it was actually a term I coined in Lexus and the Olive Tree, um, which I wrote in 1999. And my model for what I called the super empowered angry man was actually a guy named Osama bin Laden. Um, and the reason I keyed on bin Laden in 1999 was, um, you'll recall, uh, Bill Clinton, um, after the, uh, the attacks by Al Qaeda, led by bin Laden on our embassies in Tanzania and Kenya, um, Bill Clinton ordered an attack on bin Laden uh, in his base in Afghanistan. And we actually fired 72 cruise missiles at him. And I uh, wrote at the time that that was the first time in history that a superpower ever fired 72 cruise missiles at a person, a mm. uh, million dollars a copy. And I called that the first battle in history between a superpower and a super empowered angry man. Basically, what's happened is technology globalization has enabled small groups and individuals even to aggregate enough power, not obviously to take down, but to challenge a superpower. So that's we now have superpowers and super empowered angry men um, uh, and women, you know, uh, uh, interacting with one another. Um, the, the other uh, big change is that the world today, Aaron, isn't just flat, as I argued um, back in 2004. It's actually fragile. And the reason for that is globalization has, has gone apace so far, so fast and so deep that we've now connected every node on the planet. And then what we did is we took out the buffers that actually controlled the flow between those nodes and replaced them with Greece. And as a result now, instability in one node, um, one country can now be transmitted to the whole system so much faster and so much more efficiently, whether that, that thing was a, a virus in Wuhan or a uh, financial um, virus somewhere in the system. And so that to me is the context within which American power now, we should talk about it. And in that context, I would argue American power is more important than ever um, uh, as a catalyzer, uh, as a defender of the, the basic um, liberal values that came out of World War II. We don't always do it well, we don't always do it efficiently, we don't always do it wisely, but um, I am not in that school that believes the biggest problem with the world is too much American power. I've, I'm in that school that believes often the biggest problem in the world is too little American power. 
Yeah, I, I also wouldn't put you down in the in the declinist category. I mean, no. and clearly we 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 still are probably the most consequential power on the planet, with a broader uh, set of instruments, economic, military, financial, diplomatic, and soft power, to have tremendous influence. Um, how we use that influence and limitations on that influence, however, are increasingly clear. I wanted to ask you, the president. Um, and obviously, it was validated by Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, but the president seems to believe that the 21st century is basically a, a struggle between democracies on one hand and autocracies on the other. First of all, do you accept that framing as a, a functional and effective way to look at, with respect to American power, uh, uh, the most effective way to look at that um, that frame? You know, I've never been into that kind of way of thinking about the world. I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm hopeful that um, we can. Uh, I'm so focused on what's going on internally in the United States now, in terms of preserving our own democracy. Yes, it's really hard for me to think of kind of this global struggle right now when we've got this internal struggle in our country. So you know, um, uh, that's why I, I tend not to think in those categories. Not that they're illegitimate. Um, but I also tend to think much more in terms of uh, stability, instability, um, than um, uh, democracy versus autocracy. Um, uh, because the world has gotten so interconnected and intertwined, um, and because we now have nation states, well, again, let me let me step back for one second, go to 30,000 feet again. Yeah. When you and I, um, <clears throat> um, well, let's go back to end of World War II. Let's go back even farther. The world was governed by empires for millennia. Um, and then um, over the 19th and 20th century, it was divided up into all these nation states. And um, 1945, after the war, we woke up and there were 192 nation states in the UN. And the first um, 50 years after World War II were a wonderful time to be a weak little country. Why? Well, first of all, there were two superpowers out there competing for your affection by throwing money at you, uh, foreign aid, educating your kids at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, or Wichita State in America, you could be Syria and lose three wars to Israel and get your army rebuilt for free, basically, all three times. Number one. Number two, uh, climate change was moderate. Number three, populations were really relatively small. Number four, no one had a cell phone to compare their country or leader to the one in the country next door. Um, and number five, China was not in the World Trade Organization. So every country could be in the low-wage textile business. Now, my argument is all that flips in the early 21st century. Now, no superpower wants to touch you because they think all they win is a bill. See the U.S. and Afghanistan. Climate change is hammering these countries. Populations have exploded. Iran population, 40 million when the revolution happened in 1979, 85 million today. Everyone has a cell phone. And, oh, mine, mine even has a human trafficking app on it now to get to Paris. And um, China is now in the World Trade Organization. So metaphorically speaking, no one can be in the low wage business, low wage textile business. And my argument is that shift has basically stressed out uh, a lot of these frail states. We see it in our hemisphere with Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador. Of course, uh, in, in, uh, for Europe, it's, it's the Middle East, it's uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And what these states are doing is they're starting to hemorrhage their people. And of course, they're coming through, we see this through these migration pressures from south to north in our hemisphere and from south to north in Europe. Some of these states are completely cracking up. So there was a very defining moment um, uh, that happened in 2018 after the port bombing in Beirut, when President Macron of France came to Beirut and, uh, and to show solidarity to his former colony, France's former colony. And um, the, uh, the, the first thing he did um, was um, uh, when he landed, uh, he was handed a petition signed by some 50,000 Lebanese, please recolonize us. Hmm. Please recolonize us. I thought that was a very important moment because Macron, of course, said he couldn't do that. And as a result, um, what was Macron actually saying? Um, he was actually saying um, to the Lebanese, you're too late for imperialism. Okay, that era is long gone. But you failed at self-government. Um Aaron, we've never been there before in the world where we were in a situation where countries had there no no superpower is going to come save them anymore, but they failed at self-government too. And that actually promises and presages an era of a lot of instability out there, of comfort of countries fracturing, hemorrhaging their people, 
And managing that world is going to be um, extremely difficult. And that's really what I'm focused on right now. I'm much more into decency than democracy. Um, what did we learn after the what did we learn after the Arab Spring? Um, we, we learned that um, uh, the opposite of autocracy was not democracy. Um, it was actually disorder. And um, managing that disorder can be a very, very challenging thing. Excuse me, I'm just moving in the car for one second. That's the background noise. So yeah. that, that's kind of how that's how I see all these challenges. I'm, right. I'm less focused on um, uh, on democracy in Lebanon right now and more on just basic stability. Um, so a country that appears to be becoming a completely failed state doesn't come just totally melt down. I only raise the issue of democracy versus autocracy because we are involved in a, a the administration casts this as a sort of a global struggle. And we are involved in a geopolitical competition, clearly with Russia and with China. And unlike, I guess, most of the Cold War, uh, when countries were asked somehow to choose, and some did, we now face a situation. For example, one I think only one out of 10 of the largest populated countries in the world, the United States, has um, um, instituted a comprehensive sanctions plan against Vladimir Putin. We have a lot of hedging going on. Mexico, India, obviously China, Venezuela, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emiratis, the Israelis when it comes to Ukraine. And I'm just wondering in this world, what is the best framing for persuading and mobilizing states that may not be like us or share our ideologies um, to essentially um, adhere, adhere to help advance um, a set of common goods that are important to the world. I There's this great line out of Henry IV, uh, uh, Shakespeare, that Jack Kennedy loved. One character says to the other, I can summon the spirits from the vasty deep. And the other replies, but so can any man. The question is, do they come when you call? Kennedy yeah. loved that line, do they come when you call? So obviously our own democracy uh, is at risk. Um, that doesn't that doesn't put us in the best possible light. But but I'm just wondering, if you wanted a set of organizing principles for American leadership, what would they actually be? Yeah, well, you know, again, I, I'm going to come back to that word. What I would say to these countries sitting out the war in Ukraine is that I, I would frame it as one of stability and stability. I mean, what kind of world will we have if any country can take a bite out of the country next door um, or just decide to rape the country next door? Uh, which is basically what Putin has done. And so I would start there. Um, for a lot of them, obviously, the democracy argument is not going to appeal and, and has no resonance or, or particular um, relevance to them. But, uh, but order and disorder really matters. Okay, so let's, start, let's do a quick trip around the world and talk about order and disorder. First stop is Russia and Ukraine. Eight months in, you may or may not agree. I think even Pythia, the oracle at Delphi, probably reading the best of Godin trails, probably couldn't tell us how this conflict is going to end. In August, you wrote a column in which you cautioned, you said this to the dear reader, quote, this Ukraine war is so not over, so not stable, so not without dangers and surprises that can pop out on any given day. Is that still your take? Yeah, absolutely, Aaron, because um, uh, <clears throat> we have a situation where there is no natural that, you know, you and I have spent all these years thinking about the Middle East. And when we put our heads together in the back of Baker's airplane back in the um, you know early 1990s, if we wanted to, um, we could actually come up with a win-win um, a solution for both parties. We'd say, you know, if the Israelis would just do this and the Palestinians would just do that, we could imagine a win-win here. Whether they would do it was a whole nother question. Well, I think the, the problem with Ukraine right now is you cannot see a win-win um, uh, uh, naturally. What, w why not? Because Vladimir Putin, well, first of all, let me start again from 30,000 feet. When the war started, um, uh, uh, I asked myself as a journalist, where should I be? I mean, like uh, you always ask yourself as a reporter, columnist, where should I be to cover this war? I mean, should I be in Kiev? Should I be in Lviv? Should I be in Warsaw? Should I be in Berlin? Should I be in Moscow? Um, should I be in London? Should I be in Washington? So there was always only one place to be when it came to the war in Ukraine, and that was in Vladimir Putin's head. Because the whole thing was combusted there, started there, and stopped there. 
Right. So, um, uh, and because it's so much Putin's war driven by him, I mean, he obviously didn't even tell his generals much, you know, weeks before the war, what he was going to do. Um, you really, it really becomes very personal. What, what can he live with? And one thing we know about Putin is that he um, absolutely has to be able to show that he um, got territory out of Ukraine farther than where they were the day the war started on February, you know, 24th, 25. And, um, and what does the West, be, um, the, the NATO alliance believe? It absolutely must end this war without Putin having gained any territory, any benefit from it um, uh, over and above where the line stood on you know, February 24, 25. And so right now, I don't see who's going to blink. I think the most likely outcome is that the two sides, for different reasons, get weary, exhausted, um, uh, cold or whatever, and agree to a ceasefire where nobody gives up on any principle, but maybe you can get a, it's not an off ramp from the, from this highway that people talk about Aaron, but it is a, it is a rest stop on the highway uh, where the two sides basically agree to, um, to just halt the fighting for a while. And who knows where that then you could get a Greece, uh, Turkish situation like on Cyprus, you know, where that freezes into a settlement, but nobody gives up any principle. You know, I, I know a, a hell of a lot about, uh, how to fail at negotiations. And I, I would say that uh, the urgency that is required to actually have a successful negotiation and outcome, which is motivated largely by, by pain on one hand and the prospects of gain on the other, yeah. I see absolutely no pain gain ratio uh, that is going to influence or affect for both sides. But I want to ask you another question. It, it, not a philosophical one, but it forces you to kind of see around the corner. You wrote in one of your columns that the seven most dangerous words, do you remember this one? The seven most dangerous words in journalism are the following. And I love this. The world will never be, maybe eight words, the world will never be the same again. And in four decades of reporting, you mused that you avoided using those words. And I'm with you, brother, on this because I think there's far too much breathlessness in the way we look at events without perspective. But I thought about this. You you are now prepared to, you, you were prepared to use the, the words, the world will never be the same again after Russian invasion of Ukraine. Are you still there? Um, yeah, because um, basically um, I think what, what Putin did, um, and by the way, what he didn't realize that he did was, um, uh, Putin thought he invaded Ukraine, Aaron. In fact, he ended up invading Europe. He didn't He didn't realize that's what he was doing. He thought, I took a bite out of the Donbass. I took a bite out of Crimea. But when he went for Kiev, it was perceived in Europe as an invasion of Europe. And that's why suddenly Sweden and Finland joined NATO. Um, and so uh, he rekindled basically all of the, the worst memories of the Anschluss and, and World War II. And so that was a that was a very big deal. And as a result, the Europeans, Europe, EU, NATO, will never have the same relationship with Putin's Russia um, that they had before this invasion. Um, there will have to be a different security architecture, I would say. The other thing that um, uh, that really you know, strikes me about this war is, you know, I, I described this war early on um, uh, as actually this was the First World War. You know, that thing we called World War One, 1914 to 1918, actually wasn't much of a world war. Half the world was colonized then. They had no say in it. And most of the world were still subsistence farmers um, who didn't follow it and were barely affected by it. This war, this is World War One. Um, this war has touched everyone on the planet. Two thirds of the world now have smartphones to follow the war, uh, opine about it. I did an interview a couple months ago with... Uh, leaders of indigenous communities in Chad and Ecuador. And both of them talked about how the war in Ukraine had affected them, their communities, the prices of their food, their energy. Um, this is actually World War One. Okay, I'm glad you said that, uh, the global nature of this, because I've been thinking that, uh, we're, I don't know where we are in the COVID continuum, but you could argue that other than climate, um, COVID was the most world altering event on the planet since the, let's say, since the end of the Second World War. We're now two years, two years plus in it. And I'm trying to think, 
I, I thought life would never be the same after a million Americans dead and counting, not to mention the millions uh, and the destructiveness of what this virus and two thirds of the of the world's newly uh, discovered pathogens are viruses. So we're not we're we're, we're going to be living this for a long time. But I I I, I ask myself, what really has changed as a consequence of this? world altering pandemic and i'm inclined to to think not as much as i thought would change so i only i only raise that issue because there is there may be some salience and relevance to what will or will not change in the wake of this war particularly yeah. if if you're right along with pythia the oracle of delphi that this is not going to end in a humiliating cat catastrophic defeat or victory for one side or the other. Yeah. Okay, so you're moving and we got to keep moving. Um almost to my Let's driver. go to another Let's go to another easy lift. <laughs> China. My Carnegie Connect uh, Carnegie colleague Evan Feigenbaum has written that the best we could do with respect to China right now is what he calls and I love this managed enmity. And I, I wonder <laughs> I wonder if you agree, if yes or no, how, and I know you spent a lot of time thinking about China. Um, how do we even look at Xi's China today, let alone what we want and how we're going to deal with, um, with this rising power, with all its dysfunction and all of its problems, not 10 feet tall? How do you look at the question of dealing and managing China. So um, uh, let me say a couple things. There's a lot of different um, angles one can take on this and that accounts for how I think about it. Um, the first is that um, uh, for, you know, I would argue the era 1979 to 2019 was an epoch in US-China relations. Um, uh, and it was an epoch of what I call Un unconscious integration. Um, and what I mean by that is, can you just wait out here? You park it out here. I don't want to be, it'll be dark in the garage. Just park it out here somewhere just so it won't be so dark. Oh yeah, actually, Aaron, I'm, um, can I just take one second? I'm going to get out of the car and go in my house. <laughs> I'll just take one second. Now, if you can manage this without breaking connection, you you, I, I you may go down as one of the uh, one of the great risk takers of all time. I'm all good. I'm all good. Um. <laughs> Tom, I think the last time you were on the show, you actually sang a song. Do you remember that? You probably don't, um, but I have it. I have it on video. I don't. <laughs> okay. All the right. whole now world all... in, in his hands, I think. Uh, okay. All right. So. And people. Uh, exactly. Managing and dealing okay. with China. Um, so. Yeah. Um, put the lights on. Hold on. Um, so I think the last uh, 40 years or, or 40 years, 29 to 2019, were an epic in US-China relations. I call it the epic of unconscious integration, um, where we, um, if you were an American business person, you wanted to have a factory in China, you wanted to have a supply chain in China, you wanted to hire a Chinese, you did it. You wanted to send your kid to Fudan or Tsinghua, you did it. You wanted to travel to China, you did it. On the Chinese side, if you wanted to have a buy a factory send your kid to Harvard or Ohio State, um, you wanted to travel to America, partner with an American, you just did it. And over those 40 years, 1979 to 2019, we became the real one country, two systems, the U.S. and China. Not China and the real one country, two systems. We, we really fused our economies. Um, and to the benefit of both, to the benefit of both in the sense that during those four years, as a real them, that was a real engine of global. Um, about 800 million people came out of abject poverty during those 40 years mostly in India and China. And there was no great power conflict. We had wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera, but there was no great power war like we're, we're feeling today. As a four decade period in history, Aaron, that was a pretty good history. That was a pretty good decade, four decades, I would say. Now, it started to change about 10 years ago 
And that's because for the first 30 of those 40 years, China basically sold us what I call shallow goods, goods we wore on our shoulders, shoes we wore on our feet, socks we wore on our ankles, and solar panels we affixed to the roof of our, of our homes. China sold us shallow goods. We sold China deep goods, software and hardware. They had to buy our deep goods. They went deep into their system because they didn't have them. And as long as we were buying China's shallow goods, we actually didn't care whether Chinese politics or their political system was authoritarian, libertarian, or vegetarian. Who cares? I'm just buying their. I'm just buying their. Uh, I'm just buying their shallow goods. But sure. suddenly, you know, about ten years ago, the the doorbell rang here at at uh, the house or at the New York Times, and there was a salesman outside. He said, "Hi, um, I'm from a company called Huawei, and we make 5G, and uh, we'd like to sell you our 5G." And we said, oh, wait, wait, no, no, wait, wait, excuse me? You mean you want to put 5G in the chatbot in my bedroom, in the sidewalk of my neighborhood, into the walls of my factory? And suddenly China could make deep goods. And we said, we don't have the shared values to buy your deep goods. So that was a structural change in the relationship as China could compete more on deep goods. Secondly, Xi Jinping came along, looked at this great period of 30 years um, uh, in which China grew fantastically under um, a Deng Xiaoping's motto, black cat, white cat, all that matters is it catches mice. Um, and there was a huge explosion of growth in China, but also huge explosion of corruption in the Chinese Communist Party and huge income gaps at the same time. And Xi Jinping um, decided, uh, and sorry, Jiang, uh, uh, Jiang Zemin, sorry, Xi Jinping decided that he was going to stop, he was going to have a different kind of growth. And suddenly, so China today is so much more open, Aaron, than it was 40 years ago when I first started going, and so much more closed than it was yeah. 10 years ago. Xi Jinping took it on in reverse, cracked down corruption, reasserted the power of the Communist Party, stopped with the policy of rotations in government, which Deng Xiaoping initiated so there would not be another Mao. And now we have a real structural difference between the two of us, but we're still doing six hundred billion dollars in trade so there's still a lot of integration okay. and so whether it's uh, whether we're you know uh, we have, whether we have co-opetition you know competition and, and and cooperation i don't think we've quite figured out how to manage this because we've never had this kind of relationship in world war ii nazi germany was a peer economic power and a peer military power but we we really were not integrated in the Cold War, Russia was a pure military power, but not even close to a pure economic power. All we they sold us was caviar, uh, you know, vodka and matryoshka dolls. Um, China is this very unique thing that's a pure economic power increasingly, a pure military power increasingly, and we're completely integrated. And so right. what you're seeing is how we're trying to manage that. Right. Okay. Policy is driven by interests. And other than avoiding a major military confrontation with the Chinese, how would you prioritize? What do we want from the Chinese? Because I, I have a fear, and domestic politics is a huge constraint here. We'll get that in a minute. But what do we really want from the Chinese? What are our vital as opposed to discretionary interests? The must-haves as opposed to those things that would be nice to have. What, what do we need from China in terms of our vital interests? Well, I think the two things that come to mind immediately is that we we do not want you developing a nuclear arsenal that would be aimed at us. That that would be one thing. We we need some form of arms control. We want you to understand that um, you can no more you know keep us out of the South China Sea than we could keep your ships out of the Gulf of Mexico. Right. You know, um, that isn't your lake. That us and our allies. Um, and most of all, we want you to play by the the rule of um, uh, international trade and commerce. Um, you know, just yesterday it was announced that we had, um, the Justice Department had successfully um, uh, repatriated, uh, charged and convicted uh, a Chinese intelligence agent for trying to steal material science from General Electric. Um, and that we're not gonna go on this situation where you get to basically steal our stuff or force technology transfer, allow you to then grow it in a protected way in your massive domestic our, 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 um, economy, and then unleash these companies on the world uh, to compete with ours head to head after they've grown to behemoths in your domestic economy protected. So 
um, we, we want a better understanding of what uh, those kind of rules are going to be about. Right. And, and given our domestic politics, um, you wrote a piece before Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, uh, a trip you described as, quote, utterly reckless, dangerous and irresponsible, unquote. I, I would agree with you, by the way. But can we have a, well, I, I, again, I'll go back to two of my favorite American officials. Can we have a Bush 41 James Baker policy toward China? Something that's practical, pragmatic, functional with with the domestic politics on this issue. I want to get to domestic politics, yeah. your views on the broader well, let me, yeah. we let, do let, this, let me take that off. Right. Yeah. Um, so why was I opposed to Nancy Pelosi's trip so much? Um, uh, first of all, I never knew what the purpose was, the stated purpose, and it was actually never explained. Um, so my rule on China, Aaron, I begin with this rule in my own head. Um, I actually don't like to use the term China. I much prefer one sixth of humanity who speak Chinese. Gives you a much better scale of what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with one out of every six people on the planet. And don't go out of your way to aggravate that relationship or poke the bear. That doesn't mean I'm some appeaser or whatever, um, right. but we're talking about how, how those, that one sixth of humanity, how they grow, how they develop politically, how they deal with their neighbors, how they pollute or don't pollute is going to affect everyone around the world. Let's be, let's take this seriously. My second rule is I love Taiwan. Aaron. I love Taiwan. One of my favorite countries. So much has changed in Taiwan, in Taiwan over the last 30 years. There's, there's only one thing that hasn't changed. It's geography. It's still a tiny island state off the coast of China. And because I love Taiwan, my Taiwan philosophy is say as little as possible about Taiwan. Arm them as quietly and as powerfully as we can. Make them into a porcupine, but don't aggravate it by rubbing it in China's face. Because what all you want from Xi Jinping when it comes to Taiwan is one thing, that every morning he gets up and says, nah, not today. Okay, that's all you want. All right. And um, every day he gets up and says, nah, not today. That's a good day. So Nancy Pelosi, I, I just who I really admire and, and, and adore and, and call a friend. I just thought that was just really reckless. Don't right. poke the bear. Don't poke one sixth of humanity without a strategy. And don't um, uh, don't aggravate the Taiwan situation. But right. but obviously speak softly and carry a big stick. I, I'm not right. for giving into China at all. You know, my view in China with Trump, I actually supported Trump's tariffs. My view was that Donald Trump was never, ever the U.S. president that Americans deserve, but he was right. the U.S. president China deserved. Someone who would actually call the game, you know. Right. Do you do you think though that the administration, the president, has said at least four times that he's prepared to use military force to defend Taiwan? That language is much more um, specific than what's contained in the Taiwan Relations Act. Are we are we making are we poking the bear? Do we have a one China policy still? Do we really believe it? Are we officializing our relationship with Taiwan and encouraging others to do so? And I don't want to get into the issue with the tabletop exercise to say we couldn't win. We couldn't win a war out there on behalf of Taiwan. But uh, as the administration, because of Russia, in, in essence, um, become too risk ready when it comes to Taiwan? I think it unwise to make those statements um, for, for yeah. a couple of reasons. I mean, we do have a Shanghai communique with Taiwan in which we have acknowledge, acknowledged, that's all we've done is acknowledge, not concede. As to acknowledge. Right. Yeah, uh, China's claim to, uh, to Taiwan. Um, and the others, Aaron, whatever President Biden says now, when push comes to shove, would we really do that? Would would we really send planes, trains, and ships yeah. Um, yeah. to um, uh, defend Taiwan? Um, and and I lean very much in favor of doing everything we can to protect Taiwan's democracy. I think it's it's a, one of the great achievements in the world. But I'm saying I'm not sure my neighbors do, and um, I'm not sure we would do that. And you know, one thing I learned from uh, Secretary Schultz, um, uh, George Schultz, who was a dear friend of mine, and I got to know really much better you know later in life. And George was a Marine. And uh, he always would remind me the first thing his drill sergeant told him, 
Son, you have that gun in your hands. Remember one thing, never point it at someone if you don't intend to fire it. Yeah, it's good advice. Um, one yeah. of my former bosses and one of your um, person you admire said, Aaron, he said, if you go looking for a war, chances are you're going to find one. That's right. And, yeah, exactly. and, yeah. and, and, and Secretary Baker was 100% right. Okay, moving yeah. along. Um, I want to ask you for your view, uh, and we only have a few minutes to talk about this. I do want to get to the issue of what I consider to be, and you may agree, the greatest foreign policy challenge that we face. Uh, and that's um, North Korea and Iran. Both are profoundly entitled countries, and yet both are profoundly insecure. And from my experience of life at 73, if you meet a person who's profoundly entitled and profoundly in insecure, you want to kind of turn around and look the other or run the other way. And that's certainly true of a country. One is a is a nuclear power and is likely to remain, despite our best hopes and dreams, as a nuclear weapon state, North Korea. The other may seek to be a latent nuclear state threshold, having all the components of what it would take to actually produce a nuclear weapon, but not figuratively speaking, turning that one screwdriver a quarter turn to actually produce the weapon. They're mid-sized po mid powers. How, how do we even conceptualize a policy? Is it deterrence and containment? I mean, is that the best we're going to be able to do? On Iran, um, basically. They're, um, they're, I, I don't want to group them together. I have actually, but yeah. uh, you can just pick one. In the interest yeah, of I mean, time. I think on Iran, Iran is the most vexing one. And um, uh, I thought the Iran nuclear deal was absolutely the worst possible deal, except all the other alternatives, you know, and, um, uh, you know, and um, uh, it kept Iran in a um, uh, away from being a threshold nuclear power a, a year away. And um, uh, and again, from our point of view, um, every day that went by, that Iran woke up and said, nah, no, we're not going to try to close that here. <laughs> that was a good day. That In the world I live in, that's a good day, you know? And um, the Trump administration, the Trump administration did two incredibly reckless and stupid things. It tore up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TTP, yep. TTP deal, without an alternative, um, which was a hugely important, valuable instrument for consolidating our allies in Asia around our values on trade and, and, and worker rights and was a great soft, uh, a great, sorry, um, incentive uh, to actually reform uh, for China to, to, uh, to be out there on the table. Um, and the other thing was they tore apart the Iran deal without an alternative strategy for getting um, uh, Iran in a, in a situation where it couldn't or wouldn't develop a nuclear weapon. Um, they, they tore up the deal with no, with no strategy. And um, now when they did it, I thought, wow, you know, they must know what they're doing. So I, I didn't I didn't sort of jump up and down at the time. They must have something up their sleeve where they're going to get a better deal from Iran. Of course, they didn't at all. Uh, basically, they tore up the deal and they put a deal on the table, Pompeo, who is easily and without question the worst secretary of state in our lifetime, maybe of all time. Um, uh, uh, Pompeo put down a, 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 a offer to the Iranians that basically said, uh, you guys commit suicide and we'll agree to um, you know, restore the, the nuclear deal. I'm not any advocate for the awful regime in Tehran, but just on a real politic basis, they were never gonna do that. So where are we now? Instead of being a year away, they're now truly a threshold nuclear power. They're a few screws away from, from being a nuclear power. How did that work out for us? So, you know, life is not perfect. And, and everyone, oh, Obama, he didn't know what he was doing. You know, he was a wimp for Iran, you know. Turned out, old Barack, um, uh, I think, had a lot of wisdom there, that the perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. And when you're keeping Iran away from a nuclear weapon for a year, that's pretty good. Yeah, and when you make the perfect the enemy of the good, you end up neither with the perfect um, nor the good. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I want to begin to make a segue. We talk, we, there's so much we can talk about Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, the Israelis. Um, I, I want to ask you, though, in May, you interviewed uh, President Biden. You wrote a column about it. 
in which you basically said to the dear reader, I really can't tell you anything about what happened during the meeting. You did say that the tuna fish salad was phenomenal and the milkshakes were to die for. And you left with a heavy heart, you said, but with a full stomach. And you you said that you left with a, a heavy heart because your your view is well, Biden could re, could unite Europe in the face of Russian aggression. Like many of his predecessors, he could not unite the country. Um, and you seem pretty down. The last column you wrote, um, America dodged an arrow, I believe. You seemed more upbeat. And I just wonder if you can uh, tell us why. Yeah, because um, there's sort of different vectors there, because basically with, with President Biden, it was, you know, he talked passionately about how much he ran for office, basically, because he saw Donald Trump as a threat to our democracy uh, and a hugely polarizing figure. Um, and he wanted to first uh, abort that threat, which I think he's done. Uh, second, he wanted to pull the country together. And, and what we talked about, generally speaking, was, you know, his views on how hard that was, how, how fractured and divided the country was. Um, so that that applied to that conversation. The reason I come out of the midterms feeling that this is really one of the most important midterms in our history is something phenomenal happened, something unpredicted by anybody. Um, uh, and that is the sort of collective civil, civic um, identity of America um, uh, asserted itself. You know, our democracy has many features, but at its core, it has one feature. It's our ability to legitimately and peacefully transfer power. That would to for 250 years. That 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 has been that is the core of our system to legitimately and peacefully transfer power. I won, you lost, we move on. And what Donald Trump and his um knucklehead followers um uh represented in this election was an effort to abort that, to actually um uh take us down a path where we would no longer be able to legitimately and peacefully transfer power. Well, as a young reporter, I was actually in Lebanon I, for, for almost five years. I actually saw democracy falling apart. You know what I mean? I saw what happens when people hack away at the system, hack away at it, thinking it's OK. I can hack away at the system. When I take over, I'll behave a little bit better. And then one day, one too many hammer blows and the thing falls apart and you can't get it back together again. I wrote and I feared that could be our fate if we went down that road. And then something just remarkable happened. Principled Republicans, principled Democrats, principled independents got together, identified who are the biggest threats to that core ability of us to legitimately transfer power, whether they're running for secretary of state or, or treasurer or congressman or Senate. And they basically voted against every single one of them, defeating virtually every single one of them, except J.D. Vance, who benefited from a gazillion dollars from Peter Thiel and a super popular governor in a state you know much better than I do. That was remarkable. That was a remarkable assertion by coming deep within the American public and psyche that we understand this is a threat to our system greater than anything any foreign power can do. And we're going to rise and defeat that threat at the ballot box. Amen. God bless America. God bless America. Uh, I don't want to whistle past the graveyard on this one. Uh, you yourself conceded in the column that we're clearly not out of the woods yet. The midterm is generally draw around 40, 40, they drew 44% of, of voting public. The real stress test will come, I think, in, in 2024, but I'm more confident than ever. What what troubles me, I, and I, I just want to mention, I interviewed Ken Burns a while back, and he, he's tethered to a narrative that drives so much of his storytelling that there really is no us versus them. He doesn't buy this. There's no us versus them. There's only us in capital letters. In essence, it, it works nicely here, the U.S. And we need to work within that framing. Otherwise, as Lincoln warned, the house divided against itself cannot stand, and we're going to be torn apart. I, I really do believe to the core of my soul that... Uh, the, the greatest enemy we face is not Russia, not China. Climate may well be in in this in this category because it has truly planet or uh, altering impact. But the greatest enemy we face is us, and how we. It, it, unfortunately, the previous administration, the president, had a very difficult time turning the M in me upside down, so it becomes a W in we. We we need that. 
we need to find a way to come together, Tom, but I have to say, it's just really hard when I think about the dysfunction in our politics, how to translate what happened at the midterms, defeats for election deniers, triumph of rationality into a functioning political system in a binary system when one of the parties is still not respecting the norms and the institutions. Maybe it'll come gradually. Maybe the 2022 midterms were a wake-up call. Um, I don't know. A concluding thought on that before I close? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I believe I'm, I'm working on a new book right now, um, which is actually about how to write a column, but it's about more than that. It's about how I wrote, how I learned and what I saw in these 40 years. And um, uh, the conclusion of the book is that um, uh, to thrive in the 21st century in the world we're in now, um, that, you know, we're in the middle right now of a climate change and climate, a climate change in technology. Um, and if you look at nature, Aaron, which ecosystems thrive when the climate changes? It's those that generate complex adaptive networks where all the elements of the, of the ecosystem network together emergently um, to produce resilience and propulsion. Well, I believe what is required in nature is also required among human society, that the countries, companies, and communities that will thrive in the 21st century are those that manage to build what I call complex adaptive coalitions where business, labor, philanthropists, social entrepreneurs, and local government all work together to maximize their resilience and propulsion. And by the way, I've visited a lot of communities around America that are thriving because of that. You know, in the first term, the first two years of Biden, excuse me, we, we actually accomplished a lot. I mean, when you think about it, amazing, you know, uh, climate environment bill, infrastructure, you know, bill, um, uh, just to name two that were huge. We did that because we actually there are some Republicans who, who were brought on board. If we can build complex adaptive coalitions here around these kind of pragmatic things, we uh, there's nothing that can stop us. Yeah. Unfortunately, we aren't just divided. If we were just divided, Aaron, I wouldn't worry. We are being divided. That's what my teacher and friend, Dove Seidman, always says. We are being divided by social networks by uh, because dividing people and making them stupid um, actually has become a big business and industry. And no one has capitalized more on that than Rupert and Lachlan Murdoch. Um, they were in the business of dividing us and it's been very profitable for them. And hopefully, you know, they've learned a lesson here and others have learned a lesson that um, uh, you can actually hit this system with one hammer blow too many. And um, so I don't know what's going to come out of this. I'm not a some cockeyed optimist on this, but um, you know, somehow the American soul is asserting itself here. It was very close. It's going to be very difficult. But, um, you know, betting against America has always been a bad bet. And um, I'm going to stay with uh, not betting against America. Yeah, me too. I'd like to think we, we will be able to work through this and come to a better place. I must say, Tom Friedman, that with journalists like you bringing the kind of clarity, honesty, and integrity to this conversation, I think the we're going to increase the odds of getting there. And I want to thank you for sharing your time and for your wisdom. Um, well, to all of you, great to be with you, soul brother. <laughs> to, all, to all of you Carnegie Connects fans, have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll be back December 5th with a fascinating discussion with uh, Halima Croft uh, of RBC Capital Markets and Princeton's Bernard Haeckel on Saudi Arabia, Saudi oil, MBS, and the Biden administration's truth or consequences. We'll see where that goes. Tom, thanks again. Pleasure. Take care.